I've been listening to sermons now for well over 65 years. Needless to say, I don't remember a lot of those of the oldest of that group. But in all the years that I've been sitting listening to sermons, one of the most commented on parables of Jesus is the Good Samaritan. It is well-worn. It's well understood. I would say in our society, people who aren't even Christian and may never have cracked the Bible know what you mean when you say the Good Samaritan. Now, I've often heard the priest and the Levite excoriated for seeing this poor fellow on the side of the road who's been robbed and stripped and left dead and naked. I'm not dead, but wounded and naked there. And I've heard them uh, raked up one side and down the other. I have just as often heard the Good Samaritan commended for his act of charity and go thou and do likewise is a, a good thing for all of us to remember. But I can't recall hearing anybody say very much about the poor guy that was hurt. We don't know much about him, next to nothing. We don't know his nationality. We don't know his race. We don't know if he was young. We don't know if he was old. We don't know his name. And they couldn't tell very much about him because a lot of the things that told you about people in those days was their clothing, and they took his clothes and left him lying there naked in a ditch by the road. He is identified as a certain man and as he that fell among thieves. In addition to that, we know that he was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And we know that this is a parable that's recorded in the 10th chapter of the book of Luke. That's all we know. And yet this anonymous man is crucial to the story. When the priest and the Levite passed by him and looked at him, what did they see? Well, they saw a man who was severely wounded and bleeding. He was naked, had perhaps a loincloth. He certainly had not much in the way of raiment. He couldn't get up. He couldn't walk. They saw a man sorely in need of help. That's what they saw. Now, when the Samaritan walked by and he looked over at the man, what did he see? I think the Samaritan saw himself. He looked at the man and he said, that could be me. And the compassion that he had, I think this is the reason, the reason I think he thought this way, is because Jesus describes him as having compassion on the man. In fact, what he does is attribute to the Samaritan precisely the same emotion that Jesus had on many occasions when he healed sick people or fed people. He saw people, he had compassion on them. He felt sorry for them. Now, the man in this parable may be the most important of all four men who are in the parable for one re very important reason. Without him, there would be no parable at all, and there would be no object for compassion in the parable. But why was he that important to the Samaritan? He is important because he was a man. Nothing more was required. That was it. He didn't have to be white or black, male or female, in the case it was a man, but that didn't matter. He didn't have to be a Roman. He could have been a Samaritan. He could have been a Jew. None of that mattered. The truth was he was a human being. And when he looked at him, he realized that he had a responsibility to him. And here, I think, herein lies one of the most important ideas in all of theology. It's called the dignity of man. It is never stated in those terms in the Bible. But the idea absolutely is there. Dignity is defined as the quality or state of being worthy. Worthy. And the eighth psalm is probably the definitive scripture in the Bible that, that brings this forward and lays it out for our consideration. It's mentioned in some greater tale in the book of Hebrews, but Hebrews is quoting from here. So the place to go is to the eighth psalm. You're familiar with it, I'm sure. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings you have ordained strength, because of your enemies, that you might still the avenger and the enemy. When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, when I look up at the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man? that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you visit him? Why on earth do you care 
about man. Well, you made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. Now, I got a surprise this morning when I read that verse. I Something I had managed to overlook for an awful long time. The King James translators, for some reason, followed the Septuagint here, as did the writer of the book of Hebrews when he cited this particular scripture. In Hebrew, this reads, you have made him a little lower than God. The Hebrew is Elohim. Or you could say he made him a little lower than God's. It could be plural because it is Elohim. You made him have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. This is probably the definitive statement in the Bible of the dignity of man. And as I said, it's also cited in the book of Hebrews. You have put everything under his feet. It's profound. There's an even more basic statement than this, though, and it's found in Genesis, the first chapter. Verse 26, the sixth day of creation. All the beasts, all the creatures, all the animals and the critters out there are created and sent forth upon the earth. And then God pauses for the pinnacle of his creation. He says in chapter 1, verse 26, God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowls of the air, over all the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. It's worth noting just briefly, man in the Bible is said to be male and female, adopting the term and putting everybody under one term. The dignity of man arises from the fact that man, male and female, is made in the image of God. It is that simple. Every human being you encounter, every child, every baby, he said, out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, you have ordained strength. Well, you know, the mouth of a suckling? They can't say a lot, really. But here he is telling us, and I think revealing to us, that the dignity of man goes clean down through children that they also are included in what he's talking about here. All are made in the image of God. Now, there's a gentleman I'd never heard of before. I only met him this morning. His name is Pico della Mirandola. He's a 15th century philosopher, I suppose. He spoke to this a long time ago. He was a, a, human, a humanist of that age. Now, a humanist in that period of time was not like the humanist of today, who was a secular humor, humanist. The humanists of that time were elevating man to be the pinnacle of God's creation, that man, human beings, are the most important thing that God has made. You know, they're basically taking the same theme that I've been developing up to this point. This man said this, Finally, the great artisan, God, the great artisan, mandated that this creature, man, who would receive nothing proper to himself, shall have joint possession of whatever nature had been given to any other creature. Now, this is a funny way of saying it. This is, again, we're in the 15th century when this is being written. And I take this to be another way of saying that man had dominion over everything. In other words, he wasn't set over here by himself. He was over it all and involved with it all. Continuing to quote, He made man a creature of indeterminate and indifferent nature, and placing him in the middle of the world said to him, Adam, we give you no fixed place to live, no form that is peculiar to you, nor any function that is yours alone. According to your desires and judgment, you will have and possess whatever place to live, whatever form and whatever functions you yourself choose. Now, you might find some things in this to argue with, but... Again, I think some of it may have to do, you simply don't understand the rather exalted language that the gentleman is using at this time. Now he says, all other things have a limited and fixed nature prescribed and bounded by our laws. Still talking to Adam. In other words, the angels have a place. It's fixed and it's bounded. There are places they can't go. You with no limit or no bound may choose for yourself the limits and bounds of your nature. That's kind of spooky thing to think about. If God said that to Adam, of course, we don't have any record that he did, but this is derived from a 
a considerable amount of thought and from Scripture. He says, well, you get to choose what the limits and the bounds of your nature are going to be. We have placed you at the world's center, so you may survey everything else in the world. We have made you neither of heavenly nor of earthly stuff. By that, I think he means we haven't limited you to that. Neither mortal nor immortal. And that's mind-bending to think that the man is neither mortal. You seem to me like you have to be one or the other, but that's what he says. So that with free choice and dignity, you may fashion yourself into whatever form you choose. Sound unreasonable? Doesn't sound possible? And where, where in the world does that go? Well, he's not through. To you is granted the power of degrading yourself into the lower forms of life, the beasts. And to you is granted the power contained in your intellect and judgment to be reborn into the higher forms, the divine. Now that bears some thought. Here you are. You're human. You're a man. You're a woman. To you is granted the power of degrading yourself or the power to be reborn into a higher life, a divine life. He said some very profound things here that would require a lot of thought. You may find yourself arguing with him, which is all well and good, but his idea has to be addressed because it is so fundamental and so widespread throughout Christian theology of whatever stripe. It comes from a piece titled Oration on the Dignity of Man, as I said, back in the 15th century. It comes as a bit of a jar to think that man was neither heavenly or earthly stuff because we know man was made of the dust of the ground. It also seems impossible that man was made neither mortal nor immortal. But I think what he is driving at is this line, so that with free choice and dignity, you may fashion yourself into whatever form you choose. And I think what he means by the form is the form of your character, the inner man, who you are, that you can decide by the way you live your life, by the choices you make, what kind of of a person you're going to be. Now, most men do not realize they have that power. They do not realize that they are making that choice. They often do not realize the implications of where that choice may go. But I want to read that last paragraph there to you again because I think it's crucial. To you is granted the power of degrading yourself into the lower forms of life, the beasts. To you is granted the power contained in your intellect and judgment to be reborn into the higher form, the divine. Now, all this, we know that man can degrade himself. We know that man can be reborn to the divine. These two things out of what he has said, which really are his core and his conclusion, we know these things to be true. And the rest of it we is all commentary, which we can argue about and discuss to our heart's content. And it's in this freedom that man is made in the image of God, a little lower than God, for now but with the freedom to make of himself to become something that he is not today. Now, in my ramblings on this, I came across an essay by Charles Colson that was written at the time of the execution of Tim McVeigh, and I thought it was interesting. For most of his life, Colson said he had opposed the death penalty. What changed his mind was a visit to prison in prison with John Wayne Gacy. He was one of those mass murderers who killed a bunch of people and buried him under his house. And he was shocked when he got there at how ordinary Gacy seemed. Now, you probably have had the same experience he had with Gacy when you watched the BTK killer, if you did, telling the judge what he had done as a part of his hearing and having to plead guilty to what the things that he had done. And at how ordinary the man looked and how ordinary, in what ordinary terms he described the horrible things that he did. I think and I understand what he's driving at. This sent Colson back to an essay by C.S. Lewis titled The Humanitarian Theory of Punishment. For many years, Colson said, modern psychology has argued that the criminal is not guilty of crime. He's just sick and in need of therapy. Lewis argued, however, that this view strips man of his dignity his dignity, the fact that man has the power to choose whether he's going to degrade himself or whether he's going to go forward into a different kind of life. That's a choice that lies in front before man. 
It says that we're not free moral agents responsible for our actions, but rather patients to be manipulated for the good of society. Lewis wrote, quote, to be punished however severely because we have deserved it, because we ought to have known better, is to be treated as a human person made in God's image. End of quotation. To be punished however severely is to be elevated, actually, to be treated as a human person made in God's image. And Colson said, I realize this went right to the heart of a central precept of the Judeo-Christian belief. And indeed it does. And it suggested to me that there are people who abandon their humanity. They trash the dignity of man, and they degrade themselves to a lower form of life. It's hard for some people to accept this, but it's around us on every side, and it's in our newspapers every day. And this may answer another troubling question we have about man. There was a man named Amalek. He was a grandson of Esau. Esau, you recall, was Jacob's brother. So he was a kinsman. You know, they had their, their, their grandfathers, Israel's grandfathers and his grandfather were brothers. And so it was, he, he was Jacob's brother, and he was an Edomite, therefore. The Amalekites inhabited the northeast portion of the Sinai Peninsula and the Negev Desert. Balaam, the unlikely prophet, included whenever they called him up, and Balak called him up to prophesy against Israel, which he couldn't do. He prophesied in favor of Israel. He tossed out another item, which was not originally included. He said, and this is in Numbers 24.20, one verse. Numbers 24.20, if you want to re re reference he looked on Amalek, he took up this parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. Now what did Balaam see, and why was that a part of the prophecy that God gave on this occasion? And what can account for this kind of judgment pronounced upon an entire tribe of people, Amalek and all of his families? Well, the Amalekites were the first to oppose the passage of Israel as they came out of Egypt. This is singular, as again, because the Israelites were kinsmen. It is the old Jacob and Esau conflict that is still out there, still festering, still going on. And in Exodus chapter 17, this battle is described. Chapter 17 of Exodus, verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose out some men and go out and fight Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did what Moses said. He fought with Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. I expect you're familiar with this occasion as well. It came to pass, when Moses held up his hand with a rod in it, Israel prevailed. When he got tired and put his rod down, Amalek prevailed. But his hands were heavy. He couldn't keep holding them up there forever, so they took a stone, had him sit on it, and Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side, the other on the other, and his hands were steady till the going down of the sun, and Joshua whipped the daylights out of Amalek on that day. And the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book. Rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi, for he said, because the Lord has sworn that he will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Who? God will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now, he said that their, their remembrance was even to be brought out. Unfortunately, we still remember them, although we don't really have a clue where they are, who they are. If any of them are still around, at least we don't think we do. But the Lord has sworn this from generation to generation, and the time will come when Amalek is long gone. Now, what made this so bad? Why was it irreconcilable? Because you think most of the time you could get people together at a table and you could negotiate some kind of a deal. You'll do this, we'll do that, you take this, we'll take that, and we'll stay apart, you stay on your side, we'll stay on our side, and we won't kill any of your people anymore if you won't kill any of our people anymore. That's just eminently reasonable. And you would sort of think that that type of thing could be done, wouldn't you? But you know, there may have been generations in the past that would have been unable to see any illustration of this, and yet we have got one that stares us in the face every day in the newspapers and every night on television news. 
The Palestinians in particular, the Arab world in, the, in general, is absolutely irreconcilable with Israel. Reconciliation is not possible. You can't get them at a table. They've tried that. It's just, it's, it's just going through the motions. In fact, for Arafat, the peace process, as it is jokingly called, was merely another instrument of war. It was just something that he used in his further attempts to finally and utterly destroy Israel because, you see, there was nothing would serve except the utter destruction of Israel, which, when you think about it, means that he had no respect whatsoever for Israel, Israelites, as human beings. The dignity of man was gone, which, of course, so was his own in the process. Because this is what happens to people who trash the dignity of man. They trash their own in the process. Deuteronomy 25 tells us what the issue was that brought this thing to such a head. In Deuteronomy 25, verse 17, I want you to remember what Amalek did to you by the way. Moses said, when you were come forth out of Egypt, how he met you by the way and smote the hindmost of you, even all that were feeble behind you when you were faint and you're weary, and he didn't fear God. To him, these people in the, in, you know, normally what you do, you go into battle, you put your fighters out front, and you put your weak people back, you know, children and all this stuff, back with the stores. And that's the way wars should be fought. You know, the big men, the fighting men are up there fighting with one another. But on this occasion, Amalek went around and killed the old, the weak, and the infirm. And he said, don't you, I want you to remember this. It shall be. When the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies round about and the land the Lord gives you for an inheritance to possess it, you shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Don't you forget it. Why? Because Amalek had chosen to degrade themselves to the level of beasts in the way that they had treated those poor people, the weak people, in the back part of Israel's caravan. There are people, there is, by the way, a dignity among fighting men. There is a respect for the men on the other side of the battle, even though they are enemies, because they fight like men, and they fight against men, and warrior goes against warrior. And the respect for the dignity of man means that you don't kill the wounded. If someone is wounded and lying on the battlefield of your enemy, your medics pick him up. Your medics take him back to the mash. Your medics fix him up and make him whole again, even though and then stick him in a prisoner of war camp. But you don't kill him. You don't destroy him. You don't even allow yourself to ignore him because he is a man. It's important. But there are people who lose all respect to fighting men everywhere. They attack the weak and the helpless. They're the cowards who blow up children. And it brings back Mirandola's haunting sentence. To you is granted the power. You have the power to degrade yourself into the lo lowest forms of life. Men don't feel this way about honorable foes. It's been notable, in fact, in the past, at times in the past when we've been fighting with Germans, that is, those Germans as army men who really were soldiers and who really were professionals. There was honor among some of those men as they fought among our honorable soldiers as well. Now, to help understand this, if you've never seen it, I recommend Kenneth Branagh's movie of Shakespeare's Henry V. It's a fine movie. You may have to get one with subtitles so you can be sure you understand Shakespearean English. But it is very much worthwhile to see. And oddly enough, you know, the, 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 the honor among fighting men is, is well displayed in there. And the dishonor of the type of man who will go behind and kill the boys that are left behind with the stuff, which the French did on this occasion. So when men break faith with the dignity of man, they are deemed no longer worthy. That's what dignity is. It is the right to be considered worthy. They have degraded themselves to a lower form of life. They are people who kill the helpless. They don't care whose blood is shed as long as blood is shed. And they teach their children so. They create what people today loosely call a culture of death. Basically, what we call the culture of life is that culture which esteems the dignity of man. And the other culture 
trashes the dignity of man. Few men understand the dignity of man better than those who have bravely fought other fighters on the field of battle. I first heard the hymn, The Mansions of the Lord, while I was watching the funeral of Ronald Reagan on television, and I was so smitten with it. I learned it came from the movie The Soldiers. We were soldiers, I should say, and I went out and tracked it down. We Were Soldiers is a movie. It's a true story about the first real helicopter assault in, the Viet in Vietnam in the Vietnam War. The hymn, The Mansions of the Lord, is so striking. As a hymn, it's not a particularly great piece of music. It's only when you see it in its context, only when you understand it in the context of the fighting man that you, under that you can appreciate this hymn. To fallen soldiers, let us sing, where no bullets, no rockets fly, nor bullets wing. Our broken brothers, let us bring to the mansions of the Lord. No more bleeding, no more fight, no more prayers pleading through the night. Just divine embrace, eternal light in the mansions of the Lord. Where no mothers cry and no children weep, we will stand and guard though the angels sleep while through the ages safely keep the mansions of the Lord. So striking to see this kind of, a, of, a, of a, an emotion expressed from fighting men, rough-hewn fighting men. And yet it's what's interesting is so often it is among these men where you find true honor, a respect for the dignity of man, a firm belief in God, and a hope in the mansions of the Lord. To further help you understand, there's a poem from World War I, that's made its way into man's collective memory. I expect you probably have heard the title of it at least, In Flanders Fields by John McRae. In Flanders Fields the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place, and in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders Field. Take up our quarrel with the, with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders Field. You have to realize this sort of value this culture lives in the hearts of military men who feel a terrible responsibility for their comrades who die in battle. And this, this, this sentiment, if you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep. When King Saul was commissioned by God to take, it, to take God's quarrel to the Amalekites, Saul broke faith with those who died. He broke faith with the old the sick, the feeble, whom the Amalekites killed in the rear of the Israel Israelite line. He broke faith with the children who were slaughtered back there by the Amalekites as they rolled through there. He broke faith with the dead. He was the king. He was the protector of the innocent. He was the avenger of evil. And he broke faith with God. I think most of the time we really don't quite grasp why God's judgment of Saul was so abrupt so severe, so total after this, Saul broke faith with the dead. In a way, Saul's greatest sin was that he broke faith with the dignity of man. In that, it, it is that respect for the worth of man, male and female, young and old, strong or feeble, well or sick, that sets us apart from the animals. And it makes man what he is worthy of respect. It was what led the Samaritan to see the worth of the dying man, I'm sorry, of the man who wasn't dying, lying in the ditch, to make him feel for the man, to actually move him to save the man's life. As we watched the terrible tragedy and the agony of New Orleans, we saw people uphold as best they could the dignity of man. We saw who knows how many people risking their lives. We know them taking great, you know, moving heaven and earth, as it were, to save one person here, another person there, and to save those people's lives because they were human. They saw the same thing on the top of that house down there, waving for help, that the Samaritan saw lying on the ditch on the road to Jericho. They saw themselves, 
And so they went, and they did what they had to do. We also, people, abandoned the dignity of man in New Orleans. I don't know how many, because the newspapers really, and the, and the, and the news media really emphasize those people and how many of them there were, how much of a percentage they were, I don't know. I know they were terribly outnumbered by the people who were determined to do the right thing. And that's, it is that sense of the worth of every human being that has motivated people across this great country to take strangers to their bosoms. Many of them take perfect strangers into their homes. It's moved the state of Texas to accept about oh, well over 300,000 people from Louisiana, from Mississippi, who have sought a place of refuge as a result of that storm. Faye ran into a lady at the Dairy Queen at lunch just the other day who happened to be her and her two boys from down in New Orleans area. And uh, she was chatting with her about where she was and what had happened to them. And the lady explained to her that they were staying in, in the shelter up here, the uh, First Christian Church shelter, and uh, that they were being taken care of so well. The people were wonderful to them. And Faye asked her, said, well, is there anything I can do for you? Is there anything my church can do for you? She said, no. She said, the people of Tyler have been absolutely wonderful. Why? What is it we see when we see that woman? We see ourselves. We realize that that could, you know, except for the grace of God, I could be in that, sh in, in that woman's shoes. And we have compassion. We feel with. We have the respect for the dignity of man, the dignity of woman, and we want to take care of and help people like that if we possibly can. Why do we do it? Because they are us, and we see in them ourselves. If we want to understand Beth Holloway, whose daughter disappeared in Aruba, she is really an incredible woman. Consider the last stanza of Flanders, in, in the poem in Flanders Field. If you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in, in Flanders Field. And the realization that if I break faith with my daughter, if I break faith with, in, in that kind of a situation, who, one who is my responsibility in life, I am not, they, they cannot sleep in that sense until I have done something to try to reconcile the situation. And it is so, uh, you know, it's hard if you've never been there. It's hard if you've never been down that road to know how people feel who have lost someone and they can't break faith with them. I'm a little worried about our world, but I, I have to recognize that there is still an enormous respect for the dignity of man that lives among our people, and I am so thankful to live in this country. But day by day, it's being eroded by those who see man as little more than an animal in the first place. That's kind of, I guess, their job to civilize man. It's being eroded by a utilitarian philosophy that writes off the elderly as not worth saving. You know, they don't have much life left anyway, and they're, they're uncomfortable, and they're probably dying anyhow, so maybe a little extra shot of morphine will be good for them. It's being eroded by those who consider a very real human being with hands and feet and beating heart who can suck his thumb and feel pain there in his mother's womb as nothing more than a blob of tissue, having no dignity. Has the child no worth, none of the dignity God passed on to man, made in his own image, when he has ten tiny fingers and ten tiny toes and little bitty fingernails, and can do what living children do, suck their thumb? The child in the, in the womb cannot write poetry, to remind us of their worth. They can't sing hymns to plead that we not break faith with them. But if they could, we might hear them cry. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep. Though poppies grow in Flanders Field.